Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, speaking to you. Many thanks for the kind words of introduction. I know my book has a, a bulky title, you know, you are laughing, but this is actually, if you think about it, uh, also an outflow of uh, the area of technology. You know, in the old days, one would have taken a kind of a sexy title like uh, nobody wants to be the jailbird or, or something like this. But this doesn't work because everybody today, if uh, he or she is looking for uh, uh, a book in a for a certain topic, just puts in legal risk or compliance risk and the new book has to pop up. So I ended up with a title which is both boring and bulky, but it's technology. Uh, I'm talking to you as analysts, I know this. Uh, my book and the speech, which is nothing else than a quite a fair summary of my book, uh, is basically targeted as manager, uh, to managers and to a lesser extent to lawyers and, and legal managers. Uh, what I tell the managers is you have to start to think in a different way about legal risks and I going to explain this to you. And I think it's good for analysts to know what the managers uh, think or should think about these uh, risks. And you will see that there is quite some overlap with uh, what you are uh, doing. Now, legal risk obviously starts uh, with the law. Uh, how do lawyers uh, normally uh, think? Uh, lawyers are a very uh, particular profession, you know, like CFAs are a profession, or uh, uh, CPAs are a profession, or doctors are a profession. So they have a very particular way uh, to think, and uh, they basically traditionally think in terms of laws and rules and precedents. And they work on cases, uh, specific litigation, contracts, they represent people in the court, in negotiations, etc. Uh, over many, many centuries, maybe starting with uh, old man Cicero before uh, the birth of Christ, uh, lawyers have developed uh, specific thinking around these things. Now, my purpose today is to draw you away uh, from this loyally thinking about laws and to lead you into the uh, world of legal risk management. Uh, I want you to show that managing legal risk is something very different than lawyers do traditionally. But before I turn to this in more detail, uh, let me briefly reflect on the term of legal risk. Legal risk is a very strange word, uh, actually a, quite a peculiar one. Uh, normally, both as lawyers but also as citizens, we have a positivist, if not an optimistic uh, and rational view of the law. Uh, there are rules and they have to apply equally to everybody. And the law is applied in a rationalistic way by the courts, there is fair trial, there is due process, and so on. And ultimately, the better argument should win. This is very key in, in, for the notion of law. So, our view, as I said, of the law, as we learned it in the school, is a very positivist or positive one. And law regulates the society and secures, and that's the main purpose of law, a peaceful living together. Uh, law without society, we probably all have learned, would be a law in wilderness, where the mighty always wins, and the weak is lost. Or with other words, a law without a society without law is a lost or a non-functioning society. Now, the term legal risk connotes something very different. It means, in a nutshell and in essence, that a legal event or a legal case operates as a risk to a particular company in the context of business, or as a threat 
or as an uncertainty or instability. There are different levels. You know, one is a materialized risk, one is an impending risk. It's a general threat or a general uncertainty that I don't know what my legal risks are. That's the way how companies in these days, in, in particular big global companies, now see the law in this, uh, in this way. They see the law not as a source of certainty and stability, but rather as a creator of risk and uncertainty. I have called in my book, uh, I've called this phenomenon a paradigm shift. It's a shift which has happened over the law, let's say the last 30 years. When I was a young lawyer, the term legal risk did not exist, at least not in the sense we use it today. Now, if you talk these days uh, to a general counsel or a leader of a global company, and I think some people of you will talk to uh, channel councils. Uh, when I was channel counsel, I talked from time to time to analysts. Then they uh, will more often than not talk about legal risk rather than the law. And they uh, think of this legal risk in, in these terms. This is a change in our thinking which slipped into our thinking, almost unnoticed. It was not an act of government, and it was not a decision by any authority at all. It just was created, or it appeared, over the years, by the mere fact how modern society works and what the reality of the global society is for big companies. Now, let me now discuss on this general background three specific questions. The first one is, what is the gist, the essence of legal risk? And what is behind the developments which I have shown? And how should we, the business world companies, react to it? Now, let's start with the first question. What is the essence of this paradigm shift? The, let me explain this all by a very short story. When I uh, was a lawyer I uh, many years ago, I represented a client uh, in front of a quite an important regulatory authority. Uh, the, some people of uh, my client have done quite a stupid thing. It was something which was very visible uh, to the public because it was widely you know, publicized or, or seen on TV and in, in the papers. So uh, when we detected the problem, uh, we made uh, a self-reporting to the uh, relevant regulatory agency. We made a very thorough investigation and what followed was an extensive discussion or negotiation with the channel council of this uh, regulatory authority. And after many weeks and many rounds of uh, discussions, we settled uh, for a fine. And the fine was uh, 33 million uh, US dollars. It was quite a high fine at that time. But the channel council told us uh, that he needs a high fine. Uh, because this was highly political, emotional, and uh, we agreed to it. So we settled uh, with, uh, for, for 35 uh, US dollars. The general counsel was very pleased, and he said, you know, I have to bring that to my board, uh, but this is a mere formality, because this is a good outcome, it's a fair outcome, and the board certainly will approve it. So on the day of the meeting of the board, where they had to wet this uh, uh, deal which we made with the General Council, on the evening of that day, I received a call. And the call said, you know, uh, Peter, uh, the deal passed, but the board tripled the fine. <laughs> tripled the fine. And uh, this obviously had nothing to do with the law. You know, what was before was, by and large, what a lawyer would do. Self-reporting, investigation, rational uh, 
negotiation between learned lawyers. What the board did was pure emotion and pure political uh, reaction. So uh, what does this story tell us? You know, the story tells us that a legal case like this is not only the law. As a matter of fact, this case can be divided into three parts. And one part was the operation of the law, and two parts was something completely different. It was about media, it was about emotions, it was about politi uh, politics. And for me, this story still connotes the very essence of what legal risk uh, is in the mo modern world and what we mean when we talk about uh, the legal risk. There is the law, but beyond this, there are many other facts. And the key of it is that the law sometimes hits, and more often hits, companies in a most uncertain and irrational way. Before we go deeper into this, I would like to clear some definitional issues. The term legal is, uh, risk, and I think this is important for you, is sometimes, in particular in the financial world, defined in a very narrow sense. Uh, namely, best, basically, uh, is are contracts or indentures or collateral enforceable. But that's not how I operate with the term legal risk. I use mo a much broader definition. And I basically use the term legal risk as a negative outcome, uh, such as <coughs> an invalid contract, a litigation, an indictment, uh, as the need to pay damages to enter into a bad uh, settlement, and so on. This is for all for legal uh, reasons. That's what I call legal risk. There is a related uh, term which also pops up in the title of my book, and this is compliance risk. Uh, for the purpose of my book, and here I use uh, the term compliance risk almost interchangeably uh, with the term legal risk. Uh, or, with other words, managing compliance risk for me is an important part of managing legal risk. Basically, companies have compliance functions to reduce their legal risk. Uh, there are differences between legal and compliance, uh, but they are more in the shades than in, in the substance. Uh, we could say that normally a legal function is more on the advisory side and the rule discovery, whilst compliance is more in the side of uh, assurance, control, and processes. There is one exception that very often compliance and the managing of compliance risk goes beyond pure legal issues, and it extends to ethical reasons and sometimes even to things like consumer uh, protection or control, uh, contract. Uh, uh, culture, ethics, and these kind of things. So much about the legal uh, uh, risk term. Now let's turn to the second of my question. What is behind all this? I would like to advance here a few propositions and theses and theories. Uh, the first one is uh, legal risk has, as I said at the very beginning, Consider, uh, considerably increased over the last 30 years. Uh, global business leaders now see legal risk as the most salient and important threat or risk or source of uncertainty. This has been proven by a number of service empirical uh, data which have been done by companies like Accenture, uh, PLA, and uh, many others. Uh, they have asked uh, people, senior managers, what is the, are the most important risks of your business? And if you take the average, now legal and compliance and regulatory risks normally top traditional business risks like uh, market risk, economic or environmental uh, risks. 
The second of my proposition is the rise of legal risk is not a happenstance, it's not a few judges or prosecutors gone bananas, it's not about uh, bankers cheating more than they cheated 30 years ago. Rather, it is a reflection of some fundamental changes in our society. And I will come back to this. The third one is the quality of the relationship between business and governments has changed in many ways in over the last, let's say, 15 years or so. Uh, I said we all have been raised in a certain concept of law, which is rule, uh, uh, rule of law, due process, and so on, separation of powers. But in the modern world, in many places, which can become increasingly important, these concepts are simply not accepted. A good example is China. China does not have a legal system or the rule of law, as it has been developed here in the Western society since the times of uh, the Magna Carta. They have maybe a Communist Party policy, they have some regulations, but they have no idea no idea and no concept of the law. And this statement I could make in variations about almost every emerging market uh, country. The whole of Africa, even South America, which had a reception of Western uh, law, India, which had a, uh, a reception of uh, Western law. But there are also changes in the old world. Take the U.S. as an example. Uh, you, all, you read certainly uh, frequently, almost daily, about what's going on there. These huge fines which have been paid by large uh, companies. Bank of America has paid 70 billion in terms uh, of fines to the uh, American and other regulators, which dwarfs uh, uh, the fines which have been paid by the Swiss banks, uh, UBS uh, paid five, uh, Credit Suisse six uh, billion in terms of fines. Uh, but it's not only about the banks, and I will uh, show you this. Uh, and if you look at these cases, you see that they never go to trial. What basically happens, a prosecutor puts a company under pressure, and then under the pressure, the company yields and pays a very high uh, fine. So the British uh, magazine, The Economist, which certainly is known for its balanced uh, views, has recently said uh, the US justice system is an extortion racket. They have uh, written this twice in different articles, and they wouldn't write this if they not would believe it. I think my own judgment is a little more balanced and a little uh, milder, but not very much. Extortion uh, racket. And in Europe, if you look at the EU, the EU is not a government, it's a, supra, a supranational organization, but it increasingly behaves like a, a government. I think you and I, we experience the EU as a government, we see them as a, a government. Uh, but there are many cases, for example, the big antitrust cases which they have launched against uh, Microsoft and Google and others, uh, which uh, clearly are not there for purely legal reasons. They have a lot to do with politics in the technology platform. It's a pushback against uh, the more innovative uh, American uh, companies uh, to protect the European uh, businesses. And uh, you also have seen what has happened uh, in the summer with Greece and others, and now with uh, these whole uh, migration issues, where the law is simply pushed aside or overthrown, not applied, etc. So we shouldn't think it's only a problem of the emerging markets. My first observation is that the enforcement arms of governments have gained in power tremendously. Uh, as I've said in many places, they can now solve problems without going to trial. Business simply settles. The fifth one is that borders no longer play a role. Uh, 
enforcement and litigations is done across border. These uh, prosecutors uh, prosecute Swiss companies from France, uh, from, uh, from the US. So, and they do not keep by the rules which were originally developed for international law. And now, the sixth and final of my observations, and the most important one, business has not yet sufficiently learned how to react to these developments. Uh, we have a very peculiar uh, paradox here. When you go and ask the very same senior leaders of businesses who all said that these are the most important risks in their, uh, for their company, and you go then and ask them the second question, and do you understand these risks? Do you know how to manage them? Guess what? Uh, the response, uh, positive response uh, rate is it's 25%. So they see this as a looming risk, but at the same time they concede on an anonymous basis that they don't really have it under control and even don't understand it. It's a little higher amongst general councils and compliance officers, uh, but it's very low on board level. So this leads to the Third question, how should we react uh, to it? My answer is very simple, but that's what I tell uh, managers. You managers, you have to manage it. But first, you have to know how to manage it. The management of legal risk goes because it's more than the law. It goes much beyond providing legal services. Rather, and this is the key of my book in a sense, in a modern company, managing legal risk is a core management process or should be a core management process like ma many other core processes like marketing, production, HR and so on. And it will engage many other people than lawyer, many other people than lawyer, in particular line managers, which are the most important part of good legal risk management but also compliance officers, risk officers, internal auditors, external auditors, and communication specialists. Obviously, you see immediately what the problem is. Uh, too many cooks uh, and not enough integration. And when you have this problem in a company, you will have seen that in, in many places, uh, when you have too many cooks, then you have the problem of the silos, you have rise, arrive and competition between line management and compliance officers, between lawyers and operational risk managers, between communication and control functions. So this needs management and that's what I say ultimately legal risk management is an integration uh, game and it belongs into the hands of the top of the company. And this is the board and for the strategic aspects and for operational execution, it's the CEO and his or her people. So it needs a strategic approach. But what does that mean? In my book, I've developed a number of tools to manage this. And now let's say whether... It's the... <coughs> I went to sleep. Oh. The whole thing went to sleep. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, then let's okay. just press here. Normally it should. Seems to have gone. <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, let's uh, uh, make it without the slides. Uh, the you have seen it. This is the tool is basically a circle which runs over uh, altogether six steps, and it's understanding the roots of the phenomenon, 
it's the second step is defining a strategy. The third one is setting the legal risk governance. The fourth one is implementing processes and operations. The fifth one is sourcing of experts and advisors. Uh, the seventh one is using technology. And the, uh, the last one is influencing the behavior of people. These are basically uh, the seven steps which you have to go through uh, to develop a proper legal risk management. Let me uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, the manifestations and roots of legal risk. Windows Town. No, it's the Oh, okay. Very good. Don't mind. So, so, uh, sure. so uh, I think we have gone through that. These are these steps which I've described, the seven steps. Now, uh, manifestations and roots of legal risk. Uh, very uh, briefly, I, I think... Uh, to manage it properly, you need a, a clear understanding of what it is. And I have mentioned the uh, uh, elements here and there. I make a difference between the roots uh, of uh, the rise of legal risk. And the most important uh, root is uh, globalization, or rather the technology change which is behind globalization. We have more recently, uh, and this would like sound, li sound like a contradiction. After the uh, big financial crisis, we have another development in the world which I call deglobalization or fragmentation. We see in the world that uh, more and more regions or even particular countries uh, basically increase the hurdles to enter this country add gold-plated uh, uh, leg uh, regulation, legislation, and all these things. The Economist has called this the gated globe, we, which will have a very negative impact on globalization if it goes on like this. Uh, everybody is extremely concerned uh, uh, about this. And so these are the original globalization and this fragmentation now, for me, are the main uh, uh, route for uh, legal risks. Uh, but there are a number of what I call reinforcers. One is huge transparency in the world. We live in a world where almost all news travel instantly uh, by social media. Social media have made a big, big difference. We know by empirical data that today a major corporate scandal uh, is known with a likelihood of 66% within an hour and the remaining ones within a day. And this means that the public often is better and faster informed than the senior management. You know, big global companies are still quite uh, complex entities and they very often are in trans and transparent even for the top management, which doesn't know what's going on sometimes. But then somebody at the bottom of the organization uh, makes a leak or puts something on Twitter or what have you, and then travels around uh, uh, the world. So that's uh, transparency plays a big role. The other one is value clashes. We live more and more in a society where your neighbor holds very different uh, values. Uh, we have a lot of migration uh, of bodies of people. And uh, we also have uh, migration of ideas. And that means we, ha we hold now, in a global world, very different uh, uh, ideas. And this makes sometimes uh, the management of uh, legal issues of culture, etc., are very difficult. And the third one is a risk sensitivity of the modern world. In the modern world, we, the people, uh, 
indulge in a lifestyle which makes necessary to run certain risks. We travel like, we travel like hell, planes are a risk. We use a lot of electricity, nuclear power plants are a risk. We eat too much uh, meat and this heats up uh, the globe. Uh, a hotter globe creates violence, we know that from empirical data. So all this is the kind uh, of fostering of uh, legal uh, risks. But on the other hand, the interesting thing is, whilst we all indulge in a lifestyle which increases the risks, we have developed an attitude of uh, zero tolerance towards risk. If a risk reali realizes or materializes, uh, we get very exercised and uh, agitated. You can take a good example is uh, this incident in, in, in Paris. It's a fact, and don't take this as a uh, cynical uh, thing, that violence over the last uh, centuries, and in particular over the last decades, Violence in the world has gone down on almost every measure. You know, it's homicides have gone down, uh, acts, uh, uh, wars, interstate wars have gone down, but also violence the, uh, against uh, women, against children, against animals. Everything uh, has gone down, uh, with one exception, and these are uh, civil uh, wars which have a tick up in the uh, last. Uh, a uh, few uh, uh, years. So I think uh, our excitement uh, is understandable emotionally, uh, but it has no background in the uh, reality. And the only uh, reason why I mention this is this is the reality of what I call the risk society, which plays a very big role if you think about uh, these things. No, now, let me uh, turn uh, to the next issue, uh, you know, I said here, it's on, it uh, starts with understanding the roots, then it's defining the strategy. Uh, once the board has understood uh, what uh, the risks are, they have to define a strategy. And that here I have another uh, tool, which uh, basically says what... Uh, a board could do to approach this. The first one is they should make risks visible. We call that normally a risk identification. What are the particular risks for a company? The second one is understand the drivers uh, behind the risks. Every company has particular risks. Uh, a bank has very different risks from an oil company or an oil company has very different risks uh, from a car manufacturer. It's very important to understand the drivers. You know, to give you an example, Volkswagen uh, started to manufacture diesel engines for a market which traditionally was against diesel uh, engines. They knew that this will be expensive, but they, they have to be cheap because otherwise they never enter this anti-diesel uh, market. This is a very simple uh, idea of how uh, you could strategically think about it. If they had taken a strategic uh, decision about this, then probably they would not have run into these uh, problems. Now, the next steps is, uh, once you have understood the risks, you have to assess them. That's uh, uh, normally what we call measuring uh, risk. Uh, you have to make an appropriate decision. Do I take this decision? Do I open an operation in the Ukraine? Or do I sell diesel engines to the Californians? And once you have made this decision, you have to communicate it to your people in very clear te uh, terms. And once this has been done, then you have to start to control them, basically to look whether or not the people move in your direction. And then you have to give and ask for feedback. The third uh, level is setting the right legal uh, 
governance. Once you have made the strategic decision and once you have communicated these decisions, uh, you should reduce that to writing in a, in a document which you can call legal risk framework or a legal risk uh, policy. And I think it's basically kind of a good idea for analysts to look whether a company has such a document. There in this uh, framework, a company has to make the key decisions, uh, you know, who owns legal risk, is it the, the line management, which normally is the case? What is the ro uh, role of control functions like compliance or the legal? What are the reporting lines? How is the board organized? And so on. Now, once these more strategic and governance issues have been sorted out, the next step is execution. And that is clearly uh, the task for the executive and operational management. And uh, this is basically the daily job of a manager. And it basically means that they set up appropriate programs, a compliance program, that they organize appropriate uh, functions like a legal department, the compliance department, uh, that they employ, employ risk managers, and so on. And so this goes very much into the daily uh, job. The next uh, step which I have here, uh, uh, the next element is then uh, technology. Uh, and uh, I'm a little lost here, but I think uh, we have gone to the strategy. I have to go back here. Yeah, so uh, yeah, on the left, uh, we go now to the last two elements is using technology and influencing uh, behavior. And these are two very important uh, <laughs> things. Uh, this, in a sense, is where the whole development and evolution uh, lies. Technology gets more and more important in this uh, field. And there is more and more technology which allows you to manage things through appropriate platforms better and more efficiently, uh, with more impact at lower costs, uh, what originally have been done by lawyers and so on through uh, uh, technology. Uh, we have seen in the last few years a huge uh, development in this area. And uh, there is now a growing conviction that uh, technology sooner or later will replace a large part of professionals. Obviously, this also relates to your own uh, profession. And uh, but it also relates to compliance officers, uh, to lawyers. It also relates uh, to doctors. There is a whole new book which I would recommend to you to read by Richard Soskind and Daniel Soskind. It's called The Future of Professions. And uh, Richard uh, Soskind strongly makes uh, this uh, argument. OK, we can discuss that then maybe a little more in detail in the discussion. Uh, the seventh and uh, final uh, element is behavior of staff. You see that in the discussion uh, very often and uh, in the financial service industries. It has become apparent in the banking or financial crisis that the behavior of people, so-called conduct, uh, is a very important uh, element to get uh, compliance and legal things under control. Or with other words, when you look at many of these cases, the LIBOR case or other trading cases or the cross-border issues of the Swiss banks, it normally goes back to a failure of behavior of individual employees who failed to uh, comply uh, with the appropriate regulations or with the ethics. Now, uh, this uh, as, as a number uh, 
of elements. And what you very often read in the papers or have read and what regulators say, it's all about the tone at the top. Uh, that means that the management leads by example, gives the right values and so on. And that the management should use uh, ethic codes, uh, cultural statements, value statements, walk the talk and leading by example. Now the problem, and I've argued this case extensively in my board, uh, in my book, uh, there are many shortcomings attached to this concept. The tone at the top simply is not sufficient. The tone at the top was not really the problem of uh, the banks in the great financial crisis. There were cases, but very uh, few of them. And, uh, and it's very simple, you know, if, if the tone at the top is rotten or, or bad, then you are lost anyhow. And we have seen that with Enron and, and, and some other companies which really collapsed. Uh, the problem rather is not the tone at the top. The problem is what I uh, called uh, the permafrost in organizations. And uh, I've coined this term, permafrost. Uh, you see it now creeping up in, in some regulatory uh, talks, etc. What it means uh, is that the top management very often doesn't get the message down to the shop floor or the trading floor. And on the other hand, not sufficient information comes up from the trading floor or the shop floor, uh, what's going on there. And this is a very uh, serious uh, uh, problem. You can now uh, address this by a number of instruments. Uh, one is uh, traditional feedback systems, reporting, etc., workshops. Uh, then a more radical thing is whistleblowing. Uh, whistleblowing is that somebody denounces somebody else who did uh, something uh, wrong. There are a number of uh, disadvantages attached to this. Uh, one, obviously, one is with uh, whistleblowing uh, that it, it is not reliable. It only comes afterwards. It's heavily uh, tilted towards HR issues. 60% of all whistleblowing cases are HR uh, cases which have a specific HR background very often that somebody has uh, received notice or is afraid of re uh, receiving a notice. Uh, so all this and doesn't help and didn't help because whistleblowing already existed before the bank, uh, banking crisis. Now, uh, after the big financial crisis, a big debate has taken place, uh, what one should do uh, to address uh, the issue, and a lot of research has been done. This research has been done basically uh, by three different uh, strands of academia. Uh, one is the so-called behavioral economists. These are people like uh, Dan Ariely, uh, Richard Thaler, Ernst Fehr here in Switzerland all world famous people who looked into these uh, issues. Uh, how can mm -hmm. I really understand my employees? How can I get reliable information from them? How can I influence them uh, positively? Uh, the, others, uh, the other academia lines are uh, psychologists, moral psychologists, uh, social sci psychologists, uh, number of famous people like Jonathan Haidt or uh, Joshua uh, Green. And uh, the third strand are neuroscientists who have an influence on, on, the, on the latter ones. So uh, the interesting thing is that uh, these people have come up with a number of very specific ideas how you get that under control. And uh, there are two elements. One is uh, that they have developed survey uh, techniques which go much beyond the traditional survey and can establish relatively reliable results about how you people think about uh, 
values, how they think about culture, and how they think about uh, uh, the company deals and handles uh, deviations. Uh, so this is uh, one area. The other area is uh, what one calls uh, technically notching. That means how can you influence people not by pure disciplinary uh, ways or, or regulations, but by subtle influences, so-called notches, uh, that they move into the right uh, direction. We know in the meanwhile uh, that you can do a lot of uh, uh, things to have an influence uh, on, on people in this way. There is a fascinating book which has been written by Cass Sunstein and uh, Dick Toller, Richard Toller, which is simply called Notch, uh, which describes this. And if you want to have some fun about how people behave, then I recommend this book. It goes much beyond uh, uh, just banks, etc. So I think technology was the frontier of all this 20 years ago. It explodes now. I think that the behavior is uh, the new cutting edge, and it will explode, let's say, in 10 years or so. It's now an important discussion in academic circles. Now, let me conclude and ask, uh, what does all this mean for you as analysts? I think the first thing is you should accept that legal and compliance risk have become a major risk for many of uh, the companies which you analyze. This holds true especially for companies with deep pockets. It, the legal risk is another matter for uh, companies which have very small margins. Uh, prosecutors take a very economic approach. They go after oil companies, they go after uh, drug companies, they go after the banks, and I bet they will go after the big technology platforms as the next, after the Googles, the Apple, etc. These are uh, those uh, who are most at risk. Uh, and then once you have accepted this, you have to understand basically uh, two uh, things. You have to understand what particular risk is associated with a particular company you are analyzing or with an industry. And the second thing is, what does the management actually do to address these issues? Uh, the traditional approach of companies, but also of analysts, is that you write it when it has materialized. You know, I re read regularly uh, analyst reports, and when you talk about legal risks, it's all, always, always a risk which already is there and has materialized. But this is obviously no good analytics, when I can challenge you a little. Uh, and I've read very little about long-term uh, risk, where you think <coughs> that the risk can uh, pop up. And uh, I invite you to take this more long-term approach. And then you should also ask, what is the management actually doing it? Are they brushing it away, as you see very often by management and boards? You know, boards and managers, they are all more on the opportunity side of business. You know, they, they like the accelerator. They hate the brake. That's basically their nature. There, for the break, they have lawyers, but they are one floor down. And risk managers, they are two floor downs. Uh, and uh, the real <laughs> question is, to give some thought, you know, do they have a little break also, breaks also on top management level or in the board? Is there anybody who thinks there strategically about these things? So this would be my suggestion uh, to you. Maybe it's naive, but uh, you can challenge it. It's the first time I talk to analysts uh, about these issues. And now I think we have some time left for some discussions. And I take questions. <laughs>